Yeah, I think so. Oops, sorry. Yes, I think so. <laughs> All right, welcome to Science on Tap. We have a little bit of a different, uh, different format. I'm going to stand right here in the front view. Um, so, so tonight we don't really have a presentation to go over. We're going we're gonna to set up a, a, a discussion and try to see what we can do to learn a little bit about the threat that's sort of on our doorstep here in Flathead Lake and in the Flathead Valley right now. Um, so I assume everybody knows that we're here to talk about invasive mussels. Um, I think that, that what I've tried to do is, is, is put together some, a group of folks that have been actively working on either detection, prevention, or preparedness for invasion of, of, a, of a particularly scary invasive species uh, for Flathead Lake, for Flathead Valley, for lakes in general, to be honest, um, water bodies in general. So in case this is your first Science on Tap, you're with us for a, a new experience. We haven't done a panel discussion before. I'm gonna do my best to participate and moderate, which I think is, is maybe a, um, a tall order, we'll see. Um, but I, I, do wanna, I do wanna thank you all for coming and, and to point out that what Science on Tap is about is communicating the work that scientists and researchers are doing in the Valley uh, with, with the public. So really we're here to talk about about muscles tonight, but on, on the whole we're talking about, about science, so we're talking about research and what we do here in, in, in the Flathead Valley, and to give you a chance to ask about it. So sometimes when you get stuck talking about science all the time, you forget that you explain it like science and it's fun to talk about it. Um, so tonight what we'll do is I'll give you a little bit of the overview of what we're gonna, what we're gonna do and then um, have a couple, a couple introductions and we'll get started. What I, what I hope happens tonight is that we'll have a, an opportunity to discuss what muscles mean for the valley, what's been going on in the, in, in the past uh, in, in order to prepare us for, for potential invasions and what we're doing now that they're in Montana. Um, we'll give each of our panelists a couple minutes to introduce themselves uh, and, and to, to sort of talk about what they what they bring to the panel, what they're up to, and and, and offer sort of their their hopes, aspirations, and, and hopefully not, but probably most likely fears for 2017. Um, then we'll, once we do that, we'll give each each person a few minutes to kind of they all have a point they want to make, a little bit a theme to what they're going to talk about, and then we'll uh, move on to sort of under, to to a question and answer section which I hope takes up most of the evening. Um, one thing I do want to do is recognize some people that aren't here that were invited. Um, first and foremost is Eric Hansen, who is a, an environmental consultant who does a lot of work on invasive species in the Flathead Valley. And he were, if he were to come tonight, he would have represented um, the Flathead Basin Commission and the Flathead Lakers as somebody that they've hired to help them understand how to, how to do their best to prevent and ultimately, hopefully not, um, work with invasive species if they get here. So he came down with a flu on Friday and tried to muster it out and couldn't do it. He, he wasn't he wasn't willing to come in and give us all the flu. So. Here's to Eric. Yeah, here's to Eric. I'll let him know that there is a, a hearty cheers for that intent. Um, one other science on tap business uh, I should get out of the way. A little housekeeping here. Um, every pint that we order, we we get a dollar to split between the Flathead Lakers and the excuse me, uh, Flathead Lake Biological Station. So uh, drink up responsibly, and if you need a beer, just flag your waitress down. She'll make it work. There she is. She looks like she's ready to serve. So um, I think that if, if it's a real laid back atmosphere, please just wave them and, and, and get, get a beer. If we need to pass them down the line, I don't think anybody would be opposed. Um, no sipping along the way. <laughs> um, but it's a really, really good opportunity. The first thing I'd like to do is, is, is to bring up Steve Rosso and give him an opportunity to, since Eric's not here, to sort of talk about what the Lakers are up to, um, both in general and in terms of, of AIS and invasives and what they're up to to, to help protect Flathead Lake. Steve, thank you. The, the Flathead Lakers have been involved in aquatic invasive species prevention uh, for a decade or more. And, uh, and we have, uh, like everyone, been disappointed in the recent news of, uh, of the species here in 
Montana, and it means that it's critical for all of us that live in and want to protect the Flathead watershed and the basin here from these muscles um, to, to get together and, and be able to do something together that we can't do individually. Uh, the Lakers um, have been funding some of the uh, expense for uh, the water samples that have been taken in the fall. We're also very involved in the new program uh, starting this spring to sample the lake and the watershed and the Flathead Basin to uh, collect samples and analyze those samples. Um, and, and we're gonna continue educating and doing all we can uh, to make sure everyone knows about the importance of this problem and, and how, uh, how it can affect all of our lifestyles and our economy and, uh, and the environment here. Um, we've been working with the legislator, legislature and, uh, um, and it wouldn't hurt for all of you to, to mention, uh, I, I've noticed in the paper the last week that the legislators, uh, representatives and senators are very focused on the budget. Um, we talked to them weeks ago um, about how important this problem is with aquatic invasive species. And if they heard from all of you with letters, um, that would be great. Um, uh, there are going to be some other things they're going to work on besides the budget. Um, and we want uh, the aquatic invasive species issue to be one of them. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to say is that, is that we, we, we want to be sure that we recognize um, the efforts of some of our local uh, limnology uh, researchers and experts here. Um, and one of them is Sean Devlin, who was talking just a minute ago. And he has recently been awarded um, the Raymond L. Lindemann Award, which honors a young scientist for an outstanding peer-reviewed paper. And, uh, um, and he, has, uh, he has gotten this award for 2017, and he and Hillary are going to get to go to Hawaii to receive the award. <laughs> We have some outstanding scientists and people um, in the Flathead Valley that help us with these environmental problems, and, uh, and we got to make sure that we acknowledge them and appreciate them every chance we get. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give a couple minutes here to just devote to um, a general understanding of why we're here tonight. Um, mostly, and I hope that, that folks are here to learn more about the threat that, that's at our doorstep and understand that what, what's being done about it, but we might not know the organism. We might not understand what they're capable of or what they're, why you have a, a panel up here that's, that's frankly pretty frightened about the potential of, of invasion occurring and, and especially here in Flathead Lake or in, in, in the parks. So we have um, an opportunity here right as we get started to sort of catch up on what, what makes these organisms so bad. Um, a lot of times when you talk about zebra or quagga mussels or dracinids, I'm going to slip and call them dracinids. That's the, the genus that they are. Um, I'll do my best not to. Um, having said that, dracinids are uh, really, really um, a remarkable organism in a lot of ways. They are about the size of your thumbnail um, on an individual basis, but they can take over an entire lake. So it's a matter of numbers. It's a matter, it's an issue of they are, are extremely, extremely good at spreading. And they do so in a number of ways. They have larvae, which are really, really um, robust and, and can live a long time both in the water and outside of water. So they can move from water body to water body um, on waterfowl, on boats, and this is just the larvae. And dogs, dogs is a good, good example. So they, they, have a really, they have a really robust larval um, life history. So in the larval form, they're no bigger than a zooplankton. They're very small and they're actively looking for a, a, a host essentially to latch onto and grow a little bit before they drop and grow as a muscle. And it's because they're waiting for, to find somebody to, 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 to latch onto that they've grown into this really robust mechanism of, of 
being relatively long-lived in terms of, of larval organisms. So then the other thing that makes them really robust is that they, they come in and so let's say we have one larva that makes it into a system and they're just, let's say we have two to make the conversation go a little smoother. Um, you have a few that come into the system, they then reproduce rapidly. So they find each other and they're very good at reproducing. And once they start reproducing, they spread vigorously. So in, in the span of, I think about a year, a pipe that, that's in a system that has zebra mussels or before zebra mussels or quagga mussels are found, looks a lot like this. And this can be, this is a, a good visual to take in. So you can imagine if you get water from the lake or you use water that say uh, for irrigation, and it might come through a pipe like this to get to farm fields. Or if you're a power company, and you're gonna shunt water through turbines, it might move through a pipe like this, right? And as you do business right now in the Flathead Valley, this is what you're dealing with. But in about a year's time, if the lake becomes invaded, if systems around the, the, the valley become invaded, that same pipe will look like this. So I hope that this sticks in just for a second, is that within a year's time, the, the amount of, of, of establishment that these organisms have is remarkable. And I don't know if you're trying to water your crops in an irrigation setting, and you, you used to pump water through a pipe that looked like that, and you're trying to get it through a pipe that looks like this, you might notice a problem. Or say that the, the flow rate that you're used to is how you set projections for hydropower costs in the area. And all of a sudden you get 30% of that flow. Costs are gonna go up. So that's one thing that, that I'm not an expert on, but is a real threat to this, to this valley in particular is the associated problems with agriculture through irrigation and through hydroelectric power. So the potential for an invasion in terms of hitting us in the pocketbook is really, really high. That's about all I can say about it because I'm not an economic person, but I am an alumnologist. And, and so I can tell you a little bit about what they do to lakes. What they do is they filter phytoplankton. Now phytoplankton are the small algae that float around in the water column and the organisms live on the bottom of the lake. So they, they, they grow in, on attached surfaces and they, they grow in beds essentially. But they still filter phytoplankton and they filter at rates which are remarkably and almost hard to believe. So an individual, one thumbnail, can filter about a liter a day. But here's where it gets remarkable is that a TV screen that size in the lake under heavy infestation can have 300,000 organisms. So we went from one liter per day, that's not too bad, to 300,000 liters in one day on a square meter patch. So multiply that by the, the shoreline of Flathead Lake and you can quickly imagine that Flathead Lake would be filtered and the phytoplankton which sustains the entire population of fish and sustains most of the food web uh, would crash. So they immediately have a huge impact. And they've been studied in, in the East Coast, along the Hudson River, in the Great Lakes, very, very well. And, and without fail, they come into a system and they dramatically alter the food web by shunting energy from what used to be in the middle of the lake to the bottom of the lake, where it's a dead end. It essentially sits there, nothing really eats them. It, 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 it turns it into a, 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 sh a shunted food web, which essentially grows zebra mussels and nothing else. So within a couple years time, if they, if they were moving to Flathead Lake, we would see major fisheries collapse. We would see lake trout non-existent. We would see any native species that are still hanging on in Flathead Lake, which we're desperately trying to bolster at this time, have major problems. The other thing they do is, is instead of it being nice, uh, great sediments or rocks for periphyton, which is another energy source in the lake, the slippery stuff, benthic algae stuff that grows on it, they're now covered in zebra mussels, so the other energy pathway in lakes gets, gets, gets completely cut off as well. So you might think, well, cutthroat trout, they really eat a lot of uh, invertebrates. So as long as they don't you know, rely on the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, sort of middle of the lake food chain, they'll be fine. But Zebra mussels blanket the entire shoreline and there's no room for invertebrates. You have almost a complete loss of diversity of macro invertebrates when, once zebra mussels are established. So they change how energy and nutrients move through the system, through the food web, 
they are, they compete for phytoplankton and they compete for space. And within a, a few years time, the system is irreversibly changed. So I, I can't really... What's a macroinvertebrate? A macroinvertebrate is a bug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a stonefly or a mayfly or a chironomid, a midge. Sure can. Well done. Don't say sorry. Science on tap. That's what you're supposed to do. You just need to order a beer. Now. Um, so I think the, uh, the, the the point I'm trying to make is that these changes that happen, it's it's not like um, mice has changed flathead like extremely um, strongly. It, it had a very profound effect in the lake, but it's still kind of a lake. They're still fishing. People you might, you might not get to go after the, the, the species that you used to go after. Kokanee are gone, but there's lake trout to fish for. Zebra mussels will come in and there won't be anything to fish for. The way of life around the lake could change dramatically. I know a lot of, I like the, the, to, to, to understand how drastic it is. If you think about walking down on the rocks or walking on a beach in Flathead Lake, it's a relatively pleasant experience. You really, the rocks hurt a little bit sometimes. Um, but, but going down to the shoreline and, and, and getting into the water is relatively easy. With zebra mussels, it will, be a, it'll, it will be a painful and bloody experience. So not only for you, but also for if you have a dog that comes with you, or children. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever, ever run into barnacles on the, on the coast, but, but running across a barnacle rock is about the worst thing you can do. You get all cut up, and zebra mussels are, are the sharpest shell that you can imagine. It's like uh, a barnacle rock times a thousand. They're just ready to, to slice you up and, and it will make being on the lake unpleasant. Um, if you can say, oh, I just won't go in, it'll be fine. But what then what you'll be hit with is, is every year the mussels die back. And they die back in a way where all of a sudden about 30 to 40 percent of them die off. And that's a lot of muscle sitting there. And I don't know if you've ever uh, had a misplaced clam or misplaced uh, shellfish, or let's just say anything that, like that that sits around for a while, it really starts to smell. So it's not just about tactile cutting your feet up, it's also about stepping outside and enjoying the fresh fresh air around Flathead Lake will, will not be so fresh. Um, so, so there's a lot of different sort of tactile feelings coming up here. They will change almost everything we understand about the lake and everything we enjoy about the lake. So. I hope that sort of gives you an idea of, or an essence to why we're here and why it's a big deal that they've been found in Montana. Um, I think a lot of people get jaded to the fact that, oh, it's another invasive species. Oh, I've, I've got, you know, there, there's, there's plenty around. There's, there's knotweed or some kind of uh, invasive plant that's kind of a pest and I have to spray for it and things like that. That's one level of invasive species. The zebra mussels come in and they change everything. They do a dramatic, dramatic shift in the ecosystem that's so far um, irreversible. Even in systems that have had high zebra mussel populations that have then crashed, like Lake Erie is a good example, the food web has remained really, really affected. So it hasn't just been, a, oh, they're here, now they're gone, and everything goes back to normal. It's an irreversible change. It's a, it's a system, a steady state, uh, a shift. So it's, it's a remarkable change, and it's really, really important that we understand that. I think I kicked that enough. I think I, everybody, everybody following me? Yeah. Question right away? Do you have any good news? Yeah, right. You're at the wrong event, I'm afraid. I think the good news is sitting in front of you, that we have people that are, are powerful, powerfully aware of the issue and want to do a lot to work on fixing it and helping it. So I think that's the good news, is you have to look um, you know, look at the people that help. That, that's kind of the, I think Mr. Rogers said that, when there's a bad event, you look for the people that are helping and you, you sort of can, can feel better about it. So I think that's what you need to do, is you kind of need to see what's going on and, and see that there's an active, at least in the Flathead Valley, we have an active group together. And, and, and I think that might be a really good segue, actually, Tom. Um, I'm gonna introduce Tom Bansack from the Bio Station. Quick question from Steve. Yeah, I, I just wanna make one comment. Um, I grew up in Michigan. And on the Great Lakes. Why don't I pass this back to you? You can everyone can hear you. I, I learned one statistic here um, in the last few months. Um, the mussels who came into uh, the Great Lakes in the 1980s 
And in the 1980s, prior to that, um, the biomass in Lake Michigan was very diverse. All kinds of fish, all kinds of sizes, all, all kinds of food for the fish. Today, three quarters of the biomass in Lake Michigan are zebra and quagga mussels. So that's an alarming statistic. I think that gives you the weight of why we're here, right? I think that, that's very well put. Um, so zebra mussels have been on the radar for a long time. I decided that I think the best way to go about introducing the panel is just to, to simply hand the mic over and give them a chance to introduce themselves and to talk about, I sort of prompted them, sort of, with a, with a few questions. And one is, is, is what they're doing what their organizations are doing or what's happening around the valley to to deal with muscle invasion and to sort of to make ourselves as equipped as we can and then sort of what the future holds so i think those are two sort of themes that we hope to hear from each each person here and and then ultimately once everybody gets their sort of time time to time to talk about it we'll open up the floor because really it's a, it's about questions and it's about uh, um not only education about the about the issue, but also a, a good discussion about where, where we're heading. Okay, so right away I'll hand the mic down to Tom Bansack from the Flathead Lake Biological Station. He's going to discuss a little bit about Flathead Valley. Thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I grew up in New England, and zebra mussels arrived in the Great Lakes area in '88. I moved here in 96, so between 88 and 96, firsthand I watched mussels sweep through the Northeast and through the Upper Midwest. I got here and for 10 years no one talked about them, no one knew anything about them at all, and I was always puzzled why. And um, new species coming to an ecosystem can be game changers, and I, I heard the parallel with, with mysis. Mysis showed up in Flathead Lake, Flathead Lake has changed forever. No one's ever gotten rid of them, they're here forever, the fish community is different forever. The parallel with mussels is, sorry, there's a parallel with mussels. No one's ever gotten rid of them once they're well established, and they change the place forever. Uh, Steve pointed out in Lake Michigan, 80 or 75% of the biomass in the lake now is mussel biomass. I do a lot of presentations on AIS, and one of the stats that I use is that there's some lakes in Minnesota that got the mussels. The mussels are such effective filter feeders that they eat up to 80% of the food in a water body. If you have 80% of the food being gobbled up by the mussels, there's nothing left for the fish. So we've had other science on taps about lake trout, bull trout, cutthroat trout, whitefish this. None of that's going to matter if we get the mussels full blown here because they could eat 80% of the food. What you want to fish for might not matter if the bottom is completely lined with the mussels. So this is a really big deal if we were to get them. And the best way not to deal with it is not to let them get here. And um, a former faculty member at the biostation, Bonnie Ellis, was banging the drum on invasive species years ago because she spent her career studying what happened with the mysis when they got to Flathead Lake. And in around 2008 or 2009, in AIS, Aquatic Invasive Species, so that's our acronym, AIS, a Flathead Basin AIS working group was founded. And the biostation, they were founding members, the Lakers were founding members, the Flathead Basin Commission, who Sean mentioned earlier, um, they are one, they've been one of the drivers in Montana of um, awareness of the effects of aquatic invasive species because their effects are irreversible and once you get them, you've got them forever. It's, it's, that, it's that great. And so here in the basin, water is our life. It's our enjoyment, it's our fun, because that's different than enjoyment. Um, it's driving our economy, it's what most of us do here for a living, water is extremely important. And so not allowing new species to get here to protect what we have is, is a really, really important thing. And so on the ground here in the basin, a bunch of stakeholders got together. Um, the Flathead Lakers are regular um, members of this group. Uh, Glacier National Park is a regular member of the group. The Biostation, Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, uh, Montana State Department of Natural Resource Conservation, DNRC, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, FWP, um, local conservation districts, basically the people on the ground in the Flathead that understand that water is our life and our, and our way of life here, got together and um, 
had really been trying to call attention to this threat. And after years and years of talking with the powers that be in Helena, we determined that we needed to do stuff on the ground here. And AIS is not very glamorous at all. It's a hot potato throughout the nation. At the federal level, no one really wants responsibility for it. No one has enough money for it. Um, at state levels, no one really wants responsibility for it because it's a real challenge and it takes resources and time and effort. And so this valley was different. Groups stepped up, people stepped up to try to do things. And imagine some of you have boats. Who here has a boat? Have any of you stopped at invasive species check stations? Those are one of the first lines of defense. How do you get people to think about moving around between water bodies? Because people are the vector. People are moving these things around. Our boats, our trailers, our fishing gear. And so when we initially talked to the state, the Flathead Basin Group talked to the state, the state said, oh, we've got the perimeter of the state covered. Well, they didn't and now it's apparent that they didn't. And so we have in-basin check stations here trying to protect Flathead Lake. There's one down at, uh, it's now Upper Valley on your way up from Missoula when you enter the Flathead Basin. There's stuff to the north of us, east of us, west of us, down the Sealy Swan, where the local groups here that care about this watershed, the lakes, the rivers, and this watershed said, we need to do something, and they made it happen. And that's a really refreshing and optimistic thing to see when um, the powers of be weren't investing in prevention. And prevention is the best solution to this. And there's an example that I hold up um, regularly, which is uh, the, the Minnesota example. And about four or five years ago, we held an AIS workshop at, in Polson at Kotucknock, and we brought in speakers from around the nation, we brought in people from the state to, to come to this, and we had a speaker from Minnesota. And Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes and obviously there's a lot of water bodies. They got mussels in the 80s, and they have not had much overland spread of the mussels since then, because they invested heavily in education, in outreach, and prevention. They saw it as an issue, they invested on the front end. There isn't enough, there aren't enough you know, police or enforcement agents in Montana to do the policing for us. And that was what they saw in Minnesota. They let people know about the threat and people did the right thing. They cleaned their boats, they dried their waders, they did the things that needed to happen to prevent the spread. And so in Minnesota, overland spread of people moving it from water, water body to water body has nearly not happened at all. Wisconsin, one state away, effectively the same demographic, unless you're from Minnesota or Wisconsin, in which case you <laughs> entirely disagree with me. <laughs> Um, did not choose to invest on the front end in prevention and education and outreach. And today, almost every major water body in Wisconsin has the muscles, and almost every water body in Minnesota does not. So people like you, knowing about the threat and doing the right thing because you've got the facts to know that it's really bad and you have the, the information you need on how to not be part of the problem, has worked. And it's worked in you know this example from Minnesota. It's worked extremely well. And so our local group was banging the drum trying to get the state to invest in education and outreach, and unfortunately not enough of it happened soon enough. Um, to give you a little bit of a contrast, um, when we started this AIS working group, Montana was investing about $200,000 a year in aquatic invasive species prevention. Um, Idaho, one state over, currently spends about $10 million a year on aquatic invasive species prevention. Right now Montana's up to about a million bucks, but you, it's still about a 10 to one. And in Idaho, if you enter Idaho with a boat, you have to have your boat inspected and certified muscle free before you're allowed to launch in the, in the state of Idaho. They took a very hard line and extreme approach to perimeter defense. Interestingly in Idaho, the way they got that money from their state legislature was the irrigated agriculture lobby. The folks that use water for a living realize that they would be paying a lot more for water costs, water delivery costs, if they got the muscles. And so it was an economic decision to invest, invest on the front end in the prevention of the infestation of these muscles. And so 
I've been hoping for years that the irrigated ag lobby in Montana would go to Helena and talk about this, but um, 10 to 1. Idaho's spending 10 million bucks. We're now spending a million dollars a year on aquatic invasive species. It's a huge gap. Now, fortunately for us, Idaho is now protecting us to the west and to the southwest, but a lot of the muscle states are to the east and to the southeast of us. So I'm going to pass to Gordon in a second. I, I wanted you to know that in this basin, we've taken AIS very seriously for a long time. Local stakeholders and local agencies have been doing everything that we can think of doing. Workshops, presentations, signs at boat ramps, lobbying, state legislature, meeting with state agencies, and using Idaho, our neighbor to the west, as this example of what could be done. And um, unfortunately, now we have muscles in the watershed. And actually, or not in the watershed, I'm sorry, in the state. Um, we are the headwaters of the Columbia system. The entire Columbia watershed is muscle free. The states downstream from us are terrified right now because there are millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of dams that stand to get affected by this. There was a study done by the hydropower conglomeration in, in the Columbia Basin. They estimated 70 to 90 million dollars a year to deal with mussels once they get to the Columbia system. And we're all ratepayers. We're buying energy from the Columbia system, Columbia hydropower system. They pass that on to us. They're not going to eat the costs. They're just going to increase the rate of our power costs. Or if you're in the water business, the rates for your water is going to go up. So it's an ecological major threat. It's an economic major threat. And we can do something by being aware of it and being cautious about our actions and asking the state to do everything that's possible. So thanks for your time. Any questions for Tom, or should I just move on? You know what I think we should do? I actually think we should let Chris talk now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have time, Gordon. Sorry. No, he's not. But I read recently in one of the most influential scientific minds that is out there, though, just so everybody knows that. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, uh, to, uh, my name is Chris Downs. I'm the fisheries program manager at Glacier National Park. And one of my sort of other duties as assigned as a result of necessity has been to um, help the park build. Uh, an aquatic invasive species prevention program in light of all the recent developments and so forth. And this is my um, co-worker here, Brian McKeon. So he and I helped sort of uh, shape the program that's been implemented over the past, say, eight years or so. And, uh, you know, I always joke that I'm kind of the idea man, and then Brian has to inspect boats and tell people yes or no whether they can put their boats mm -hmm. on Lake McDonald, a much more difficult uh, proposition. And, and he'll be able to speak to some of the practicalities of actually putting something like that onto the ground. Um, I too am a New England transplant. Um, not that it's a contest, but I moved here in 1991. Still not a native. Um, so again, a, a very similar. I worked for Idaho Department of Fish and Game until 2008 and came over to Glacier Park um, to work for the Park Service. And I remember the formation of the Flathead Basin AIS work group. Um, I was in a room at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and there were a lot of folks that were mentioned that were that were there as well. Tom was there, and some other folks, and some local legislators were there. And I sort of was just kind of listening, taking it all in. I just started to work for the Park Service here, and, and uh, it was, this is named Virgil, one of the local legislators. Um, he just looked at me and said, so what's the park doing about invasive species? And I certainly wasn't prepared for that question. I kind of thought, well, that's a good question. I don't think we're doing very much right now. And, and I guess the take-home point is, even though we're part of a, a, a much larger federal bureaucracy, Glacier Park has some really unique attributes that sort of make it easier for us to act um, versus a big state that has a whole bunch of diverse interests. Um, the Park Service mission is to, prefer, to preserve the aquatic ecosystems uh, unimpaired for future generations. That's pretty straightforward uh, management direction for native species. Um, and we also are an area of exclusive federal jurisdiction. So we have um, the authority through the superintendent, through federal laws, to, to take what actions are necessary within the, you know, the exterior boundaries, the one million acres that's Glacier National Park. And the superintendent has a great deal of authority and discretion in um, you know, administering uh, those responsibilities. And the way we were able to, uh, to back up a little bit, so after that meeting, I went back to the park and, and raised the question and said, you know, 
invasive mussels um, are now a big issue for the Park Service. One of the sort of alarm bells that went off, and I think that sort of triggered some of the things that started happening in Montana in 2008. Um, mussels were found in Lake Mead. That was big news. It's the first time they were found west of the Rocky Mountains. I mean, it was always an East Coast problem, slowly creeping westward, but bang, there they are in the lower, um, you know, lower Colorado River, uh, Havasu and those places, and, and folks started saying, wow, this really is for real for us in the West. We're not immune by some way, shape, or form. Um, but when we went to park management and said, hey, we need to be doing something about this, the discussion was, well, do we even understand what our risk and what our threat is? And, and the perspective I'm gonna try and bring tonight is one from uh, coming from a place where we didn't have a program, we were given quite a bit of latitude to develop a program with support from park management, which is really how this thing was successful in terms of Glacier Park putting their program together. Um, but the reasonable questions were, what is our risk? And we went out there and we collected information on water chemistry. There were some models out there where you could look at the pH of the water, the calcium content of the water, what your peak water temperatures were, and essentially how much boat traffic do you have you get an idea of whether your risk is low, medium, or high. And if you're making a decision whether to spend money on a program where there's no additional funds coming in, that's pretty responsible information to have. There's some stuff you want to have to make a decision whether you're going to pull somebody off of, you know, extra, you know, changing, taking care of the bathrooms at Logan Pass versus having an extra person to do um, boat inspections. Those are things you need to, information you need to have to make those decisions. So we had information on whether it was habitat was suitable for mussels, and most of the parched waters were at that moderate risk level. Um, we have borderline calcium levels, but they're not calcium levels that put us outside of the range of places where zebra mussels and quagga mussels can establish. So biologically, yes, they could be there. Um, but, but are they likely to be introduced? And that was the other question we had to answer. So we did an initial boat survey of folks coming into the park, launching their boats in 2008, and we found that we had people coming from all over the country bringing trailer boats to the park. And I want to say there was 12 to 14 different states that had mussels and people were coming launching their boats in the park. And even one person said the last place they launched their boat was in Cayuga Lake in New York, which is infested with zebra mussels. So that was sort of like, you know, we have this low, uh, low frequency of potential introductions, but a huge consequence. And we had some really supportive uh, park management. We had Jas Cartwright was there. Um, we had a really su um, supportive deputy superintendent. Um, Brian's side of the equation is in the visitor and resource protection division, our law enforcement division. Brian does permitting. Um, but everybody was on the same page. And we were able to put in place a fairly, at first what was not a fairly aggressive program. In 2009, we required all boaters that come into the park to get a permit to launch. It was a free permit, but it was mandatory. And it required a screening, sort of, by the boat inspectors. And we pretty much gave all Montanans a pass on getting an actual formal boat inspection if they told us that they hadn't been out of the state in the past 30 days and their boat was registered in Montana. Because at that point, the risk of from Montana boaters was fairly low in terms of the, the big nasties like zebra and quagga mussels. We still have like flowering rush and other aquatic plant invasive species, but we don't didn't have mussels in the state at that time, so we figured it was pretty low risk, and we didn't know what to inspect, what to expect in terms of ramping up a program. Um, we had no idea even how many boats were launching in the park in a given year, and it turns out it's been really consistent. About a thousand boats a year we inspect across the park. That's not a lot. We spend about $100,000, $120,000 a year to facilitate those thousand launches out of a population that come to the park of 2.3 million people, roughly. So it's a, it's a small component of the overall park visitation, but it is a component that's traditional use of the park is boating, and park management decided we would put together a program that would minimize our risk of invasive species coming, of zebra mussels particularly coming into the park by doing an inspection program. And at that time, we have all these border states that are mussel-free, so far, they'd be filtering people coming up into Montana, all these border checkpoints in Montana, and if we inspect every boat that comes into the park, that's several layers of protection. So, you know, it was a, a reasonable way to build into a program, um, you know, a boat inspection and essentially restricting an opportunity that had been there for many, many, many decades. Um, and the program got more and more strict over time. Now, 
until recently, everyone had to have a boat inspection, regardless of whether you're from the state of Montana or not, because we had things like muscle, a muscle showing up on a boat at Dayton, that sailboat that came in, and you know, it was 2009 that had a muscle on it. We had Ration Water Milfoil and Beaver Lake. And it became apparent that it's not just non-resident boaters that pose a risk, right? Do we think that some guy from you know, Utah or Nevada came up and launched his boat on Beaver Lake and put Ration Water Milfoil in there? Probably not. Um, but so it basically it, it meant that we need to inspect everybody coming into the park. And that's sort of where we sat until the fall of this past year when we got the news that mussels had been found in Montana. Mm -hmm. During that time, the Park Service had also put together an emergency response plan um, to deal with just this type of situation. Again, park management, you know, we had these programs in place, but they needed stronger justification um, for what we were doing, why we were doing it, and, and where we were doing it. So we put together a, a group, myself, Brian, and a couple other folks from the park and some outside experts put together um, what's called our Aquatic Invasive Species Action Plan, and that was signed in 2014 um, by Superintendent Mao, and it sort of codified all the things that we were doing in terms of inspection, uh, monitoring, um, habitat, you know, habitat monitoring, water temperature monitoring, and um, it laid out you know, how we might handle situations where mussels are either under our first level response found in, in, a, in a state surrounding Montana. They weren't until recently found in any of the states around Montana. Um, the closest that I knew they were was on the east coast of North and South Dakota on the Red River, and they hadn't really advanced any further than that. So a tier one response, we're all supposed to get together in the park and talk about, you know, what does this really mean in terms of risk? Do we need to ratchet things up a notch and, and uh, take more aggressive actions? And then there was the tier two response, what if they're found in the state of Montana? Well, that turned out to be the case. They went right past being found in a state next to us and being found two hours drive to the east of the park. Yeah. Much more serious even though for the Blackfeet that are right next to Tyler. Yeah. So, um, you know, through what I would say was, uh, you know, a really amazing amount of cooperation, particularly when you wow. consider, you know, even within the federal government, we were able to get a program up within our park, up and running, um, that has been a model for not only the Park Service, but for other areas around here in terms of putting a uh, program together to reduce risk in a really short amount of time. And it really came down to having everybody pulling in the same direction. And it also came down to having people locally here in the community and in the Flathead Basin that were really supportive of it. Um, you know, the questions more so often come, in, not why are you doing this, but we're glad that you're doing this. And people like Karen Miskey on the Platte Basin Commission, and just a lot of local interest in the community really provides a lot of support for managers to make what are sometimes really tough decisions. And sometimes, you know, people are afraid to make tough decisions for fear of whatever sort of political backlash there could be. But there's so much local support for this issue that I think it's really critical in getting our program off the ground. <coughs> um, yeah, I guess that's, you know, in terms of our program evolved that's kind of it in a nutshell i don't know if uh if brian wants to talk a little bit yeah okay Hold on. so chris stole most of my thunder <laughs> what we've done so far but uh what we're planning on doing in the future uh right now we're we have that full closure in effect and we we believe that's probably going to stay in effect at least through 2017, but into the, the foreseeable future, uh, at least with private boats. Uh, we, we determined you know, with a thousand boats coming in and probably only about six or 700 individual boat uh, inspections. Um, in other words, there's, there's repeat visitors as well. Uh, that the risk of infesting waters at the, t at the, the top of the, uh, the, the crown of the continent three major watersheds was more important in protecting that than in allowing that small percentage of users uh, to, to boat. Now there is a, there is a, a, a pretty large contingent uh, of non-motorized users as well that are gonna be affected by these closures. And um, uh, non-motorized boats are less of a threat, although 
uh, in, unless something is clean, drained, and dried, and it's really hard to get, you know, if you, you know, in a boat, in a kayak, for instance, getting any residual water out of the at the bottom of your kayak, it just takes. Uh, I mean, you can, you know, shake it up and down. You you, you need a uh, paper towels constantly to get the the water out and, and dried up. So. Uh, while they're a lower risk, um, we determined that until we find out more about what the threat is to us, we're going to keep it closed to all, all boating. Uh, there is a chance that uh, the concession boats that stay in the park will be allowed to, to launch again, so there may be some opportunity for uh, renting uh, concession boats for, uh, for launching. Uh, there's some other ideas as far as this is completely off the cuff. Uh, we've, Chris and I have only talked about it casually, but uh, you know, if people would be willing to leave their boats in a designated area in the park, you know, local visitors, uh, or I'm sorry, local residents, uh, and then we let that boat out and they just launch in the park uh, after an initial inspection, you know, that's, that's pr pretty much says that you're gonna leave your boat in Glacier National Park for the whole summer, which doesn't get you a lot of use uh, sometimes. So. Uh, until we can find out more about uh, what that threat is going to be, uh, and that's going to deal with, that's going to take place when the state uh, gets all their testing back and they do all their complete testing. And that, it's probably not going to be until after 2017. So um, that's kind of where we are with that. It's disappointing, but we just felt like the risk was greater than the reward for a limited number of people. All right, so, so we don't have a So far we've heard a, a lot about what, what sort of the history of the basin and, and how, how folks have, have tried to be prepared. There's been a lot of talk about preparedness and, and things like that. And I think that, that the, what the gentleman from the park we just talked about is, is a, a grade A example of, of preparedness. And I think that there's a lot to say about what they've done and what what their forward thinking really ha has led to, and, and I think that it's safe to say that because of that, right now Glacier is, is probably the safest safest group of lakes in in the state, um, and, and that that's that's remarkable. That's really well done. So so we've talked a fair amount so far about the history and about prevention. And I think think now to, as a segue and to give Gordon an opportunity to talk a little bit about is is they're in the state, so that the state in, in general, not the state government, but the state is impaired. We we have them in the state, they're here, they're on our doorstep. So now now we, we can we want to stick to our guns in terms of our preparedness and our prevention techniques. Um, but but how do we know if they're here or if they're not here? And I think that this is this comes down to the idea of detection. Detecting invasive mussels is not as easy as you might think. It's it's I'd, I'd like you to, to, to go and find a thumbnail out in Flathead Lake. That is essentially what you're asking to do. And you're asking to do that in a way that you can do it so timely that if you do happen to find one, that they haven't had a chance to breed yet and they haven't done anything in terms of establishment. And also, by the way, you have to know exactly where they are. So it, it's, a, it's a tall order. And I think that, that some of the, I know that the bio station is, is an active, uh, proponent of, of detection and we've done a lot of sampling since the announcement uh, came about de detection or, or uh, invasion into Montana and I think that that Gordon is a, is is Gordon Lucart from the bio station is is a particularly um, apt person to talk about it and, and so I'll give him a few minutes to, de to talk about detection of zebra mussels thanks Sean thanks everyone for coming if you need a restroom break, like George over there, <laughs> don't be shy, just go. Um, I was first going to mention that there's been enough said almost about the negative impacts that are likely when muscles arrive. Property values probably will decline. I heard from a lawyer a couple weeks ago that property values might have already declined a couple percent just because of the risk. So that wasn't mentioned and maybe municipal water supplies. Uh, you know, pipes being clogged would cause, cost us more. Um, so I w I'm a professor at the Flathead Lake Biological Station in the University of Montana. I have been at the Biostation for six years. I got into using 
the really exciting advances in genomics and new technologies for fish and wildlife management and conservation during my PhD at the University of Montana. And then I started using DNA detection techniques to study animals from feces and feathers and hair and fossils. I mean, you can get DNA out of fossils that are tens of thousands of years old. So when I moved to the bio station about six years ago, it was a natural and pretty straightforward and easy to start taking water samples and testing for DNA for whatever organism might be in the water. Um, urinating, defecating, sloughing cells, filter feeding like muscles. And so we, um, with help from the Flathead Basin Commission, the Flathead Lakers, we developed uh, DNA tests for zebra mussels and Eurasian milfoil and some others. Um, so I was just gonna want to mainly reiterate the point that um, it's really important to, technology exists for early detection by swabbing boats, taking water from boats, taking water samples from lakes. And we need to know where the mussels are to control and prevent their spread. And now is the time to sample DNA in waters because when the water's cool and there's not much light, UV, especially if it's under ice, DNA can persist for some weeks in the water. So um, if we could detect and map and identify water bodies and locations where the mussels are or might be, that would allow us to be prepared for the summer boating um, season to be especially careful uh, to prevent spread from water bodies that are invaded. Um, so I would, one of the main things that's needed is funding support from the legislature that I understand started meeting today. Um, so I'll just reiterate what Steve, I think, said is contact your legislators if you can and suggest more funding for boat check stations, education, early detection, including DNA detection. Um, it's, if we, there may have a, a, a window of time here, a good opportunity to sample water bodies now and detect the presence of mussels before they spawn, which is when they release gametes that turn into larvae that drift for one or two weeks. Once they spawn, um, a water body is not likely to be recovered and anything downstream, not likely either. So there's this window of time now to sample a lot and test a lot and try to localize where mussels might be. And there's not much funding for that. Um, yeah. It's admirable everybody is doing all this, but it's sad when the gentleman up there says, but once they're there, you can't do anything about it. So, uh, it's admirable that you want to prevent it spreading from one place to another. No system of, of pre prevention is looking at that. So, are you essentially telling us that once the muscles are in a lake, that lake is doomed? and there's no treatment at all? Because I haven't heard one, anybody say anything about treating them. Yeah, so that's a good question. Repeat that question. The question was, are it's we- It's shorter form. Yeah. <laughs> it, once mussels have been detected or invaded, adults identified in a lake, is it too late to do anything? Is the lake lost and everything downstream? And the answer is, is usually yes. But there are examples of eradication and failure to establish. For example, at least two water bodies in Colorado had DNA detections for years. And then it, the DNA signal went away and they never detected the larvae in the water, which you take water and you look under a microscope. So, um, however, those were water bodies with lowish calcium levels and our calcium here is higher, pretty high. So once they've spread, I mean, if you detect them in a smallish location, like a small bay, and they're localized, there have been eradications, if you can go and identify them and treat them with one of at least three products, you can successfully kill them all. Probably kill other mollusks in that small area as well. Snails and other, you know, we have enough, one native muscle on this side of the divide. So there is hope, um, especially with drawdown in some water bodies like Tiber and you know flat has drawn down 10 feet anyway um, but you need to get them early it's like cancer a really good analogy and this has been published in scientific literature if you detect it early you can 
eradicate and prevent spread, or at least slow the spread. Spread within the water body, and most importantly, spread to other water bodies by you know, boat check stations, monitoring, and perhaps if it's a small colony and you treat that area and you, you get the product on top of all the mussels, you can kill them and eradicate them. Thanks, Thanks to each of you for being here. It's very important and very educational. What are the ecological conditions or the substrates that the mussels thrive upon? Um, is it that calcium alters the pH or what, what, what is it that in specifically that um, ecologically they are thriving on? They need a certain minimal amount of calcium to build their shell, certain temperature, which it turns out for one of the dracinids, the quagga muscle can actually be down around 40 degrees. You know, people talk about 50, 55 degrees for the zebra muscle to spawn, but the other quagga, which often has come in and replaced zebra by being more competitive by spawning earlier at lower water temperatures, um, and then pH. And I don't know the details, so if you want a detail of the conditions in any hard surface, even some soft surfaces, but many hard surfaces, is where we target our sampling for early detection and where you know, boat marinas are in boat launches. Yeah, I can elaborate a little bit. Um, these particular muscles, they spin a thread, kind of like spider web. We call it a bissel thread, and they can glue themselves to anything. So they can coat mud beds, they can coat sand. Hard surfaces are easy for them. Our native muscles can't do that. Our native muscles tend to bury themselves in sand and burrow a little bit. So if any of you ever find a muscle that's attached to anything, it's the bad kind and you need to call someone immediately. So they can grow on anything, and that's part of the issue that has come up in you know, the Great Lakes area of Lake Erie, where what used to be sandy beaches are now glued muscle beds that, you know, Sean mentioned you can cut your feet and you can get infections. So these particular muscles, if they have warm enough water to spawn, enough calcium to grow their shells, and the pH, if you have a highly acidic pH, a low pH, the shells can't grow. But we've done, we've done, um, analyses here that show that water conditions in most of the flathead are just fine for the muscles. So, um, thank you. What are the what are the substrates that allow them to create that web? I mean, is it is it a mineral issue? The, I'll, 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 that question is is um, so so the 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 allowing them to, to spin the bissel threads is actually they don't need much to do that. They just need enough food. Um, and so that's one concern about Flathead Lake that, that I've been looking into. Um, no, one, no one really knows what kind of food they really need, but they're so good and so effective at, at, at essentially filtering out the, the, the phytoplankton that they don't need a lot. They're really efficient. So in systems like Flathead that doesn't have a lot of phytoplankton, it's still plenty for them to, to essentially scour that biomass and, and grow. Um, so I think... I, Right now, I'd like to just take a second and, and thank everybody on the panel. That was, I was really impressed. Nice, nice work. And thank you so much. And I, think, I think the best thing to do is if you have a question, um, what we'll do is I'm, I'd like to either we could repeat the question, which I think is probably the most viable way to do it. So, so if your question is not repeated, please. Uh, um, nudge the presenter or the answerer to, to repeat it, um, if you could, um, help me with that. And then I'd like to actually to, to ask a question. And I think that it's, it's likely the most important question, um, at least the, the folks in Minnesota would say so, is that what can we do in this room as boat owners and maybe shoreline owners to, to help prevent invasion in Flathead Lake? And I think that probably that I'm just gonna to have to pass the mic directly to my left to get the best answer. I think that uh, the more, you know, when we first started doing boat inspections, we had a lot of pushback from mostly local people because, you know, they're not in Montana, we just wanna launch our boats. And as the threat became closer and people were more educated, about what the threat entailed, we got a lot more compliance with people, and a lot, a lot of the people that um, were repeat um, 
users of, of Glacier with their boat, they were much more acceptable of, of getting a boat inspection because they don't want them either. And uh, so I think as far as what the average person can do, uh, if you're in a water area, you know, you see somebody with a boat out of state, you know, mention to them, uh, to tell you the truth, people that are from states that are infested already are, are usually pretty good about it. Um, and that's most of the states in the country. So uh, there's only a few states where you have to probably uh, mention to people that, uh, you know, these are a real threat. We don't want them in here. And I think just uh, the, the overall knowledge that, you know, at all the marinas, um, if you can get people to put signs up um, and just educate their customers. I know a lot of the boat manufacturer or the boat um, uh, companies, the, the marine companies that have been trying to find are selling boats have asked us, you know, how they can help out. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it's in everybody's best interest, including the people that are, uh, that are not necessarily going to use the, the waters, but that are, uh, that are enjoying just the, the economic benefits and just living in this area of, of, the, of the waterways. Yeah, I just would echo the same thing, the education. I think the Minnesota model suggests that education is the most cost-effective way to, to do this. And, you know, peer pressure, you know. Yeah, as well, I mean, the kids, the kids know about this stuff, my kids know about it, and they come back, and there's some great programs. Um, What's the message? What's being Well, I think the basic thing that we try and instill in all is the clean, drain, dry message, and we try and be consistent about that. These are critters that live in the water. You dry them out, give them enough time, they die. Um, so if you have a seasonal neighbor who comes from some place that may have mussels, making sure you have a conversation like you see in the driveway about their boat that they're about to put on Flathead Lake. But I think it's peer pressure and changing behaviors to make sure that when you pull out of whatever lake you're in, you pull your drain plug, let all the water flow out, your live well head is pulled. Just sort of those behaviors that become it's almost embarrassing if you don't do, you know, when you're that's got a lot of value. Are there examples of places where larvae have been detected where there are no adults ever emerged? We've, we've only discovered larvae in Montana, is that correct? Colin? That's correct. So we don't know which species, for example, because you can't tell visually from larvae if it's the zebra or the quadrant. So the question was, are there examples of water bodies where larvae have been detected, but not adults? And I alluded to earlier a couple water bodies in Colorado, several at least, where larvae were detected, you know, one or two, and maybe for more than one season. And another water body where DNA was detected repeatedly for multiple seasons, and then the signal disappeared and there were never discovery muscles. So the yeah, there are examples where larvae are detected and subsequently there's no invasion or no adults detected for years. If that's the case, did they compare the water and the surrounding areas to find out if there's as the gentlemen were asking before, is there a particular environment that the larvae can be there and then they all of a sudden die out and is that environment different from other water bodies? Yeah, so... Do you understand what I'm asking? No, sorry. Oh, well, if you have one water body where you have larvae yep. and they don't survive, and you have another water body mm -hmm. where you have larvae and they yep. do survive, what's the difference in the water body or the right. surrounding okay. environment? So the example I just gave, I can talk about at least um, superficially, those water bodies had low calcium, much lower than ours, 10 or 20 parts per million. And I think <laughs> ours are 50 or 100. Um, but it is possible that, you know, a male and female muscle could, on one boat hull, could release gametes that form larvae that are subsequently detected, and the boat leaves the lake. It's possible. But if you detect multiple larvae repeatedly through time, like was done in Tiber, multiple locations in Tiber Reservoir over two months, at least July and August, it's most likely, it's by far most likely there are adults in that water body. Whereas Canyon, for example, I think there was only one out of eight or ten, I don't know how many samples, but not hundreds and not tens of samples in Canyon. There was one individual larvae and one sample detected. And you know, there's hope there, 
that there's not an adult colony. On the other hand, most of the few folks I have talked to, where there's water bodies, where they detect larvae, it's too late. There's already adults in the lake that produce those larvae, and they've been there for a couple of years, growing large enough to produce lots of larvae, for example. So there's hope, but it's, it really is variable and depends on the water body, is my perspective. Is there a natural predator? Mm -hmm. um, bluegill or red sunfish <laughs> love them and eat them a lot. But it's not enough where I've read about them existing and being introduced to hammer them back significantly. I don't know of other predators. Not natives. Not natives. Uh, you mentioned that Idaho spends $10 million a year on Canada 1. Has there been an assessment done of what financial needs for Montana are not a really effective you know, The question is, if Idaho spends ten million a year and we spend one, what would it take? What would we need to spend in Montana to effectively safeguard our water bodies and our borders? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know if a full economic assessment of the cost of a ramped up prevention program like that has been done. Yeah, they took a look and said too much money. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, Montana's bigger than Idaho, so it would probably cost us more. Um, in Idaho, the program is largely funded now by a boat inspection sticker. It's called a sticker program, and a lot of states use them, where if you're a boater and you want the privilege of boating, you have to pay to get your boat certified muscle-free before you're allowed to use your boat. Montana government has been very, very resistant to that idea. They don't want to put the burden of the cost on boaters and fishermen, and they don't want to impact any recreation, especially by, well, internally, because we get to do whatever we want here, but externally, they don't want to prevent any tourists from coming here and spending money. So they're concerned that 20 bucks a year for you as a boat owner would deter you from enjoying Montana waters. So. For years, I mean, we're talking five years now, we've been talking, we really need a sticker program like Idaho, it's funding the bulk of their program, and Helen has been resistant to that idea because of the impact on recreation and our enjoyment that people from Montana and abroad would, would, would get. Well, that's the all right, so I think the best, the best plan for questions, since there's a lot, which is really great, and that's why we're here, is to wait until you're called on, and, and I think if you can just be patient, we'll get to you. We'll do the best we can. I think folks are, are here for a bit and happy to hang out and talk, um, and if not, they're, they're, they, we got them wherever we want them. So, <laughs> um, so I, I'll try to, to, to point out a question, and then if you guys, when you're done talking, pass the mic back to me, and I can repeat the question and hand it to I think might be the best person to answer it. So you had a question, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, someone alluded earlier about uh, waterfowl being a boat to bringing the larger larvae in. So, what about all of the tens of thousands of geese, the osprey, whatever? Are they bringing this stuff up to Texas, to Louisiana? Okay, the question was, is, is the vector of waterfowl transporting larva from body to body? Um, the larvae are robust, but they're not that robust. So they're not hanging out for a, a thousand mile migration. Um, usually it's, it's a more local event, and I think that that's actually one of the most interesting research questions that's going on right now with zebra mussels and quagga mussels is how, how um, I, I guess the, the the robust is, is, is almost the right word, but how well can, can larva last as they're being transported in, in the different natural vectors versus man-made vectors? By far, the number one vector of zebra mussels in the country is people. So waterfowl, although a natural um, vector uh, transporter, is, is a, a drop in the bucket relative to the thousands of boats that visit Flathead every day from all over the country. So we, we got to beat by far. There's no need to, to to go after the geese, I think. Um, so I, I think that, that anybody else have anything to offer? I think that's about the best answer we can give. Um, OK, here we go. So there's been some studies looking at how these things would, again, just looking from a practical perspective, let's just say they do eat them. Um, do they survive when they go through the gut? 
and the more finer shelled clams, not mussels themselves. This is just a study on clams that went through one of the diving ducks because diving ducks do eat these things. Um, they found that the freshwater species of these clams, their shells were generally crushed up and the clams themselves were dead. The one species that was able to successfully pass through the gut and was alive uh, was a, a marine uh, version of this particular clam. So, you know, it, but again, you know, as Sean mentioned, um, the work that's been done suggests maybe you could get it going from pond A to pond B in a very localized area. Um, there was a study, and the study design made me smile as I was listening to it because they took these mallard ducks that they would shot, they froze them, they covered them in water with a belly ring, they tied them to a pole, and they drove around at 55 miles an hour to see which belters were still alive at the end of it. And there were a few, but just the study design itself was entertaining. But, but the duck was dead. The duck was dead. So, I mean, in theory, you know, short distance, short duration, but I don't think it explains nowhere around the state of Montana to the tip top of the Missouri system. Isn't this is seemingly so low. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why why there's only five ducks. <laughs> I guess we can start freezing fishermen, but boy, I don't know if that'd be popular. Question right here. I have two questions. The first is probably for Tom. You mentioned the Columbia Basin watershed and the fear downstream. Is anything happening at the moment to um, fight that fear with funding from those people to, to, to come and contribute to us? And also from local and downstream with ideas like a sticker fund, if people want to write in and say, you know, we're bringing our boats from out of state, you would pay 20 bucks for a sticker, who do they write to? Great, so the questions are funding mechanisms for more prevention in the state, one being the downstream states, and yes, uh, Bonneville Power manages and runs and profits from most of the dams in the Columbia system. They have viewed it as an economic issue, not an ecological issue, so they're gearing up to pay a bunch of money in response to infestation. They have not stepped up in the prevention arena, which is been disappointing. We've different different members of the working group have talked extensively with BPA and they kind of passed it around and said, okay, we'll pony up when we have to, but not before. Um, that being said, the Army Corps of Engineers that also operates a lot of those downstream dams is coming to the table with significant funding. I think uh, four or five million dollars is coming out of the Army Corps. Um, the Army Corps has responded nationally at a pretty significant level because um, they've seen what happens. They've already been dealing with the eradication and the cleaning. I mean, it's manual removal. It's guys in hazmat suits scraping these things off. It's toxic chemicals. It's shutting your dam off and drying things out for a month. Well, you don't make a dime when your dam shut off. So the Army Corps it, nationwide is reacting and responding to funding, and the Army Corps downstream from us in the Columbia um, has been promising money for years now and it seems like now it's going to be shaken loose from them so yes and no on on your first question in terms of those downstream players um i'm not sure how to answer your good samaritan from another state question what we really need is folks in the state to talk to our representatives and legislators to say we are willing to pay for a sticker program because we value the resources that we have. I think internal pressure and comments and contact would be more effective than, than external because these are our elected officials, these are our shared resources. Um, I'm not sure. We've been trying to set up Montana with Idaho for years so we can learn from their successes and it hasn't gone all that well. So. I think internal comments and pressure from Montana residents would go further than someone from outside the state saying that they'd be willing to pay 20 bucks to vote in Montana. And where should those comments go? Uh, to uh, your elected official from whatever district you're in. Um, and what we've seen is that the, the Western Montana representatives are aware of this. They realize it's a problem. Flatted Lake is our bread and butter, and you'd have to be blind not to see that if you live over here. But in eastern Montana, their view of water and the value of 
healthy fresh water is different. So there is a bit of an east side, west side difference because out east you use water to irrigate crops. Out west we've got lots of water we use it to play on and fish on. So um, probably to the governor, you know, if our legislators here are already aware of this issue and they are the advocates for increased AIS activity statewide, then going straight to the top to, to the governor is probably the next step. All right, we'll switch to the back of the room here. Uh, two questions. Um, what's the data show from the inspection stations, both in the park and statewide? Uh, are they detecting any incoming fossils coming in? And the other part is more for Sean, is for the rest of the panel, is how early can your DNA detect the muscles within a water body? All right, so the two questions are, we did some substantial uh, testing or sampling at least at the beginning uh, or middle of November was it uh, in Flathead Lake where we sampled about 30 sites and 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 we, we sampled that using eDNA as, as the detection tool um, we do not have those those samples back yet um, we are in the midst of, of well, I hope that they're run Gordon when will they be done I'm putting you on the spot Two to four weeks, so about eight weeks we'll have results. <laughs> right. So, so the other question about that is, is we 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 jumped in and, and and the director, to his credit, um, allocated some some funding to pay people to go out and do the sampling, and so he put about ten thousand dollars in um, to get us a quick and, and uh, I think a fairly thorough sampling of the lake. Um, but now we have to raise the money to run the samples, which is the bulk of the cost. So the uh, Flathead Lakers have made a very good um, and a very gracious uh, um, gift, donation, is that what you call it? I don't know, uh, effort. They, they, they started, they, they, they stood up and they, and they handed us some money to, to run those samples and, I, and, and we thank them for that. But we're about a third of the way there. So um, we, we will at least have one sample from every site we collected done, roughly. If we're a third there, we took many samples from each site. Um, and then how early, I'm not quite sure what the scale of your second question was, but I'll try to reiterate it here. Um, how, how does the timing work in terms of when we sample and when we can detect versus invasion? And so the, the, that's an unknown, and that, that's a big unknown. So the, the problem is, is that even if, if you think about a thumbnail in, in Flathead Lake is pretty small, a molecule of DNA is even smaller by, a, you know, ridiculously so. So if, if we're worried about that thumbnail, you can imagine our worry about a, a molecule of DNA. Um, we have methods that concentrate DNA and, and that allow us to sample thousands and thousands and thousands of liters of water at a time. To, to detect that single molecule. Um, but once we detect it, we really, it doesn't give us any information about how long it's been there, if it's from an adult or a villager or anything. We're developing those tools and maybe down the line the research we can figure those, the, we can answer those questions. But ultimately right now we don't know. And I think that the, the, the first part of your, your question, question one was really easy to answer. Question two is, is um, we've got an influential mind here working on it. I think is probably the best way to put it. We're um, we're strapped for funding to develop those uh, tests, those raw research that we need to do um, to understand how well eDNA can work in terms of the question in, in the scope of non-detection questions like how long, sort of quantifying the detection versus qualifying it. Um, we can get a yes or a no, but understanding what. Uh, what information is hidden within that yes or no is, is a little trickier. Um, well, it's probably so, more for the Great Lakes because those guys have had it for a longer time. Yeah, they know they have it. Detection so, is not an issue there. So, right. so it's a different question. I mean, that, that's the... But that, you, have that, to, you have to have 10,000 uh, know, elements before you get a detection. And right. So, I, that's a question that we can't answer right now. Um, so I, have to, I get to lean on my crutch of science and say, I don't know. Um, I don't have any data to say. Um, let's go over in the corner. Question. I have nothing against sticker fees. Let's face it, we all benefit from keeping muscles out of our lives. It's a public good. It's not just something that people with folks 
who need an inspection yes. benefit from it. We all benefit from it. And hence, let's not limit ourselves to sticker fees as the only way to get the funds to address the problem. This Hoorah! Is this is yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so the, the, the comment was is that um, limiting our, our, our scope to sticker uh, programs is, is relatively unfair because we all benefit from the pristine beauty of Flathead Lake or uh, clear, clean water without invasions. That, that, and, and so I think the comment was was that we should we should all sort of. Let's recognize there are other revenue sources that can be drawn upon and should be drawn upon. As the question, I'll get to right. my question, is there is nobody from the state here representing the state. We referred to the need for state funding. I guess the question I have is why is somebody from the state not here? Were they invited? And what can we say about the position the state has in terms of our appointed officials, not our elected officials, but our appointed officials? in addressing this problem. Well, I'm, I'm really, uh, so the question was, if I can reiterate it, is why don't we have a state official here, an, elect, uh, uh, an appointed or a, an agency representing the state? And I think I think what, what you mean is FWP. DNRC. Or, I mean, who's that? DNRC. DNRC would be, DNRC was not invited. I did not send it out to DNRC. FWP was invited. Um, I'm, 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 I want to hand the mic to Tom so I don't get into trouble here, but I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. um, FWP was invited, they declined to come. Um, I think that there were a couple reasons why, and I think that the, the reasons that they gave me um, in three different ways with the exact same language was that they didn't know if it was a policy issue or a biological issue and they couldn't decide who was the best person to represent FWP at a forum like this. Um, that being... <laughs> yeah, for the record, I didn't do that. That was not good. Um, I think that that's an important acknowledgement, and, and I declined, I actually was going to mention that I invited them earlier, and I decided at the last second not to, because um, I figured someone might prompt the question, and if you ask, I can answer, but if I bring it up, you know, um, I look ungrateful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the point is, is that they were invited. I'm not sure why they declined, other than they couldn't find somebody who would accurately represent them. Um, there's a lot of heat right now. There's, a, it's a turning into a political issue, and I think that for the sake of, well, for the sake of, of my intents and purposes here, is that we want to keep it about the what's being done and what the positives. The good news. What what's, what's uh, the good news versus the, the issue? Greg's chomping at the bit here. He's got some of this. Yeah. Keep it short. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll hold off. And the last thing I'll say about about FWP Fish Wildlife Parks here is that I think that there's um, they they are an important player in this in this this uh, issue, and. They are at the whim of political pressure, and they have a huge, huge, huge role to play and a huge job ahead of them, um, considering what's been found in Montana. And I think that it's silly to, to you know, throw them under the bus, good or bad, when, when they're in a really tough spot. Um, that being said, since they declined to come to my event, to the Lakers event, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to say, well, they don't get to, they don't, they didn't stand up and say anything. So, um, oh, FWP, oh boy. You, all right, hold on one second. We'll get to, I, I think that's enough said about, about the other state. What I would encourage you to do is contact either people who, um, at FWP, if you have relationships with, with folks that work there, and talk about the fact that they were missed tonight. I think that that's the message I'd like to say. I would very much like to hear what they have to say about the issue and, and how um, both their hopes, aspirations, and fears about 2017 and, and what they're doing, how, how prepared they are. Hillary? Oh. I'd like to hear them answer questions. Yeah, and answer questions, which is, I think, the main reason they didn't come, um, to be honest, was that they didn't know who could answer the questions the best. Enough said? Close enough? Maybe enough said? Nowhere near enough said? I don't know. We'll leave it there. All right. So everybody's pointing over here. Georgia, you seem to have the group collective wanting to hear from you here.
Okay. We'll get to grades. Right. Well, I have some comments that might address some of the All right, we'll give you the microphone. Hi, I'm Georgia. I work with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. My employer and friend, Paula Webster, is here. The tribes are another key player in this myriad or this mosaic that's going to be required for management. And I have a lot of positive things to share. I, I, first of all, I applaud all of you for being here. And I love the questions that we're hearing. And I want to encourage you. Um, in a former life, I worked as an educator. And as a teacher, it's really important to give students a positive example. And we're all students and learning about this. So I spent a lot of time today talking to people who have handle the issue of invasive species well. And I think we've got a great group of, of people in front of you who are a local team who are doing phenomenal work. Um, so be encouraged by that. But I also reached out to two different people today. One was a research scientist in Wisconsin who was grappling with the issue of what do you do when you got them? And he emphasized it's so important to do meetings just like this. I want to share with each of you, if from the social sciences, we know that every person in this room has at least 100 points of contact. Some of you may have more than that. If you think about who you know in your service organizations, from your workplace, your neighborhood, your church, wherever you go and talk to people, each one of you can talk about clean, drain, and dry. In this room tonight, there were about 80 people, that means... If each of you has 100 people in your point of contact, over 8,000 people will get informed after one meeting tonight. The other thing I want to really encourage you with the knowledge is the tribes are taking this incredibly seriously. This is priority number one. As Paula can attest, this has consumed our work life, and the tribes are not waiting this out. They are out in front on this. They're taking this very seriously. We're having a meeting day after tomorrow to come up with an on-the-ground response on all tribal waters within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. What can we do? And that includes reaching out and working with other groups in the basin, including the Biological Station, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, DNRC, the Flathead Basin Commission, the Lakers, Whoever will listen to us and we can learn from as well, we're eager to be there. That's why we're here tonight. The other entity I spoke to today was uh, the AIS coordinator at Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is often touted as the single greatest example of a community of a lake system that got it right. They don't have muscles. I spoke to their coordinator today and I learned a lot. And I hope this encourages you. They get over 550,000 boats on that lake per annum in less than a six month period. They have no muscles. Let that number sink into you. 550,000 boat visits, no muscles. They also have a AIS program that costs them $1.5 million per year to maintain that. Most of that money does not come from the state. I really applaud your question, sir, and I hope this answer will encourage you. They do have a sticker program. They're incredibly effective. Their residents are completely behind it. 750,000 of that 1.5 mil comes from local residents as well as visitors who are more than happy to pay $20 to $120 per year. They, they prorate their size based on the size of the boat and whether you're an out-of-state boat. If you're an out-of-state pulling that boat in and out of the water, you're going to pay more. The other big burden of that cost comes from the local irrigators. A very small stipend of that comes from the state. So there are solutions. There are people we can learn from. There are states who are doing a phenomenal job at this. And when I asked this gentleman today what he considered to be the number one tool and keeping Lake Tahoe muscle free, he said it was public education. People move these things, they don't have legs. They're not going to get around on their own. So, if you can educate your public, and each one of you in this room can do that, you've got your sphere of influence. Use it, clean, drain, and dry. And it's interesting what you learn when you talk to folks. 
uh, research coming out of the state of Minnesota, they had public facilitation meetings in Minnesota where duck hunters attended, and there was a really well-informed duck hunter who put his dog in and out of the land of 10,000 lakes and learned that his dog was picking up villagers. He actually did the analysis. So he met with a group of duck hunting organizations in the state and told them you need to clean, drain, and dry your dog. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we're really hoping from a tribal standpoint, when we get out in our communities and we talk, we want to learn from the people coming. You know, we don't have all the answers, but there are going to be people in the audience, just like you guys tonight, who are going to have solutions. And we want to hear them, and we want to act proactively because that's what the tribes do best. You're never going to find a group more motivated um, the people who love the water to protect the water, except maybe the group that this is their homeland. This is their only homeland and they're very motivated to protect it. So um, be sure and keep an eye out. We're gonna be launching public meetings. We have to be collaborating a lot with Tom and Gordon and all the others at Yellow Bay. And we really hope to have you come out to our meetings and that they're as well attended as this one because we'll benefit from your input. Thank you very much for that perspective and that, that information. That was great. Greg? This, this kind of goes to, this, to the same idea as clean and drain. What we're talking about is boats. Gordon and the guys at the fire station, I mean, this detecting them once they get in the lake, let's get over it. Let's try and detect them when they're in the boats. You know, the people in the park have uh, closed it off. It's not that I don't, I personally don't feel that's out of bounds, but you realize that it is the boats that are moving these things. If they're wakeboard boats, that their bladders never get empty. They shouldn't be allowed, I don't care where they came from, they can't clean, drain, and dry. It's the boats. If, if Gordon Lukert had his way and if Cody Youngbull, another DNA scientist at the biosafety had their way, we'd have eDNA at the boats, at the boat inspections. We and dogs. And dogs. I mean, I know it's weird, unless you've seen the, the muscle-sniffing dogs, it's an incredible uh, tool. But it's the boats. Let's make our legislature aware that we're serious about this. The drive-by rate on Highway 93 in the summer is typically 50%. 50%. 50% of the people that, that are driving past don't pull in. And partly it's because they're from Missoula and they were in the lake last week and, and all that stuff. But it goes, to, I think it goes to your point that at the, in the park that the threat is so much more than the inconvenience of, an, of a boat inspection. So to talk to your legislators, try to get some money sent to do the very best inspections that we can do of everybody. So I, I think that's a, a good segue to talk just for a moment about some of the technologies that we're trying to develop at the, at the bio station. Um, we have we have a, an incoming, or he's here now, but moving here permanently in, in, in a few weeks. Uh, Cody Youngbull has developed an instrument that can actually take uh, uh, samples and, and process them within about 20 minutes. We'd understand if a, if a boat, a water body, a system, uh, anything you wanted to test is, is has zebra mussels present or not. So the idea of waiting two to six weeks, two to eight weeks, whatever it might be, for lab results is, is nearly going to be a thing of the past if we have these instrumented um, uh, systems. Now, the, the capacity or the, the, the sort of uh, futurism of these of these uh, technologies is that we could envision not just um, check stations, but little little monitors on every boat and little monitors on every launch that could be monitoring in situ in real time if there's zebra mussels present in that area. And as soon as they get introduced, we can have a team there to find them and get rid of them. So th this this technology and these machines that we're developing are are I mean they're cutting edge. 
bleeding edge science fiction. The fact that we could have these theoretically on every dock in, in Flathead Lake running a real-time network monitoring telling us whether or not they're here and talk about early detection, 25 minutes, we know they're here. That would be remarkable. And, and what's lacking in that, in that regard is, is funding. Um, technology like that is expensive, but we have the capabilities and the, the, the concepts in-house and we know they work. So it's a matter of developing it and getting it into a, into a, a forum. I can't agree with Greg Moore is that, that really what we're talking about here tonight is, is anytime you talk about disease and you can think about invasives as a disease, is you, you talk about vectors. Epidemiology is the study of vectors. How, how things move is, is critical to understanding how people get sick, how lakes get sick. So understanding how around the flathead we can, um, like I would love to see somebody, you know, find a boat and, and say, hey, have you been checked at a grocery store? And no, you haven't? Well, you have to. Don't launch until you have. These kinds of interpersonal relationships, these kinds of on-the-ground tactics that work. Public shaming is, a, is, you know, kind of the thing that we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't take it to that extreme. Good Lord. But I would say that we all care about the lake enough to not worry about saying, hey, you need to get your boat checked. I see you don't have a sticker. What are you doing? And when they say, oh, I'm just blah, 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 you say, let's go right now. I'll walk you to the station. We'll, we'll walk down to, I'll show you where it is on a map where you need to go. Those kinds of things are really what's going to save Flathead. In a, in a, in a, I mean, um, I, I think that's a, a strong takeaway. Both, and and, and it's, it's, the reality of the situation is, is that's what it will take. Steve, what, what do you have to say? Uh, I, I want to make a comment. Um, a little bit about what's, what's going on for the future here. Um, uh, uh, there were some questions about um, how we're changing with the newfound information about uh, discovering mussels in the uh, Missouri River Basin. Um, one of the proposals that's been made and is in front of a lot of the local legislators and needs to be supported, I think, is from the Flathead Basin Commission. And they're proposing that now that we have found some evidence of mussels in the state, that it's no longer viable to create a perimeter around the edge of the state. We now have to create regions in the state. And they have suggested that we divide the state into three regions, the Flathead Basin, the Missouri River Basin, and the Yellowstone River Basin, and that we uh, do our inspections based on the perimeters of those basins. So, um, uh, so the Missouri River Basin would be a containment basin where we would monitor and inspect boats and, and uh, fishing equipment and wet waders and, and all those kind of things, dogs, whatever, um, that move, that move uh, uh, water from one place to another um, to contain it in the Missouri River Basin and prevent it from getting into the Yellowstone or the Flathead Basin. Um, and so, so that's one of the things you guys can, can look into. Um, I would Google Flathead Basin Commission and get on their website. I'm, I'm guessing that Karen has, Karen Miske, who's the executive director there, has that proposal on her website. And, and that that's something to, to write a letter to your legislators and support that kind of an effort. Um, the idea is that we would create some, some interstate inspections. Um, the Flathead, uh, or the um, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has concentrated on inspections on the perimeter of the state and not within the state. We need to move inspections to within the state to make sure we don't move these kinds of invasive species between the river basins. And, uh, uh, and so, so that's one of the proposals that's being made now to, to help advance the inspection efforts um, to control this problem. I think we have a, a couple of time for a few more questions. I'd like to point out that the Flathead Lakers have put together a fact sheet and by way of public education and, and the, the points of contact, if you want to take a few of these to hand out, excuse me, to your to your, your Lakeshore administration or anybody, your, your housing uh, 
group, anything that you'd like to do to, to pass the word. These are really informative, they make the point, and they're, they're short. So they'll give, you, they'll give you the facts you need. Um, I think what we'll do is let's, let's take four more questions. Let's we'll start over here. What efforts or steps are you taking All right, I think that, that if any of our samples are positive, uh, I think what we, we don't have a clear idea of how we'll inform people. I think the first step is, is that we get in touch with every organization that we possibly can and say that Flathead's not clean. And then hopefully what that will do is, is most importantly what we would need that to do is open up a funding floodgate. We would need a lot of money. Flathead Lake is big and we would need to attack it in a way that's, that's unprecedented to find out what bay they're in. If they're ubiquitous, then we, you know, I don't know what we'd say then, but, but really I think that, that the, the number one thing to do, we have a list of contacts that we would get in touch with and say, hey, we have a positive result and we need serious funding. And I think the number one on my list would be a phone call to the governor's office. So I, Tom, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, early detection is key. It's our only hope. If we found something, and we sampled strategically around the lake, so if we found something in one area, um, divers underwater. We've got a whole bunch of divers who've called us and said, as soon as you need us, we're ready to deploy. Divers as far away as Missoula. We've got a bunch of divers in the flathead and at the station. Um, folks have mentioned the muscle sniffing dogs. The lake is dropping right now. If there are any muscles on the shoreline, the dogs would be able to detect that entirely. Um, the bio station and, and certainly Glacier National Park in Flathead Lake, we have no management jurisdiction at all, so we would basically be turning over response to the state and federal agencies that, that, that are charged with that. Um, that's a little, and, and the tribes on the south half, thank you. Um, but that's a little worrisome because the rapid response of the state was not rapid at all. These AIS groups locally, we've been encouraging the state to develop a rapid response plan for over half a decade. And then we got a muscle detection and then they put together the rapid response plan and their response team. So I'm, I'm worried about that, that the timeliness of the response um, wouldn't happen. To use a toxic chemical in a water body like Flathead Lake is gonna take permitting, it's gonna take process, it's gonna take permissions that are not in hand in place already. I know the tribes are being more proactive about that, moving down that pipeline to where they could respond more rapidly. Um, Biostation, we're providing information for the, for the authorities that actually have responsibility to act. So what Sean said, we tell those folks as, as soon as possible because as soon as we get a detection, it's a race against time until they reproduce. I would just add the other most important thing beyond education and spreading the word is funding. FWP is underfunded. I think if they were more funded, they would have a rapid response plan, and they don't. All right, so how about, yeah, right up front. Yeah, in terms of contacting our representatives, is there more effective means? It would be a phone call best, email, written letter? What, what's All that? three, I would say. that The number one thing you can do is, is to contact and contact repeatedly. So I just read an article about um, how to actually, and it was written by a woman who is a staffer for, um, for Boehner in, in the U.S. House, and she talked about how how to get their attention. Because your, your letter is not necessarily going to be written or, or read by a representative at the federal level, but you're likely to get read at the state level. So if you show up with six letters and, and ten emails and two phone calls, um, even if they all say the same exact thing and they're dated sequentially, your, your point will be made. So and I think I it's a matter of volume. I personally should do all three there, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's... Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You invest what you can personally, and, and I know that, that that's asking a lot. But yeah, I mean, it's a matter of, if you're gonna write a letter, it doesn't hurt to, to print off three copies and three different dates and send them in. Um, getting getting the, they, they essentially assess, their their office assesses, uh, assesses the public interest by number of, of contacts. So if we all call in tonight, we all call in tomorrow, we all call in throughout the next week, they're gonna be aware that, that you know people are worried about invasive muscles in the flathead. So it's, it's a really important, and maintaining that contact. 
And, and another, another thing is if you call in, say, hey, how can I keep your attention? What can I do to help you be more aware of the situation? So anytime, if you can get one person and find a staff member, get a name and call back and say, I would like to talk with Steve. I would like to talk with Bill. I would like to talk with whoever and get that person to make a personal contact in the office. That's the other big advice that I can give is that if you can, if, if you have the time to call up, you have the time to make a personal connection, that's the best advice. Keep doing it. Call back and just say, hey, I'm, I'm happy that you guys made a note of my phone calls. Just that reiteration and, 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 and over and over is the way to do it. Squeak wheel uh, uh, technique. Any other questions? You had a question earlier. What's, what's your question? Oh, she's. Yeah. I'm hesitant. I'm looking around for faces I know. So. Hi, I'm Sean. Hi, <laughs> Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Um, so we are cherry growers from the. Oh God. It's all right. <laughs> it's better. It's better. We are cherry growers from the upper mountain side of the highway. Does that make sense? Not the lake. Yep but we had been interested in the lakeside uh, cherry orchard. And after seeing that pipe at the very beginning, like all I could think of was like, oh dear God, thank God we didn't buy that orchard on the lakeside because what would happen? You know, my happy little creek up top is hopefully will be fine. So I'm just wondering, I went to the cherry consortium this last August, September, there was a lot of information about invasive species, about a lot of um, the noxious weeds and whatnot that we have to work for. But if agricultural money is what you guys are interested in, have you worked with the cherry growers in the area? This is the first time hearing of it. Thank you. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them. Take the mic. <laughs> No, uh, it, it's been an idea we've had for a long time, but do what you can, and a lot of... They're really receptive. <laughs> yeah, and you know, actually, we, we've worked a lot with the cherry growers on water quality issues, where chemicals you put on fields and on crops can end up in our water. Um, but yes, we, we, should, we should do that. Um, like I said, it's been an idea, using Idaho as an example, it worked there. Um, comes down to capacity. I do a lot of my AIS work in my spare time. It's not what my main focus of my job is. And a lot of us that are on this AIS group are like that. And you go to these meetings and there's all these things that we'd like to get done and then you go back to the office and you do your real job. So um, I'll admit it's a failing on my part. I've known this to, this to be an avenue of potential um, for a while. I just gotten to. Okay, so come August when they start asking like who we want to have talk at our little group again. Like, who do I ask for? Do I ask for Sean? Do I ask sure. for Tom? Tom? Just call the station. You call the station and we'll call sort it station, out. And you'll figure it out? Yeah. That could be my suggestion. Or the Lakers, too. Or the Lakers. Okay. Did you have something to weigh in here? There were a couple of questions that I feel I can address. One was, what do we do if we get a positive detect? And yours was, how do we help? And how do we get involved financially? I think the tribes have a partial answer. Um, we are developing a rapid response plan. We are hoping to have it finalized very quickly. And in that case, if we get a positive detection that Yellow Bay, for instance, called us, we would be boots on the ground right away. I also want to encourage you, um, I hope this is encouraging, when we asked our peers on the north end of the lake what their rapid response plan was, they said they were waiting to hear from the state. So I called the state to ask what their rapid response plan was, and they said right now their efforts are focused where they know they have a problem, Cayman Ferry and Tiber. Now the good, the good news, and I know that sounds terrible, but really there's good news, is when our tribal folks reached out to the north end, they were eager to partner with us because there's a real vacuum of leadership on this. The tribes are stepping up. I want you to know everyone around the lake is very interested in this. It's an easy sell to protect these waters. What I'd like to, again, encourage you to do when the tribes, I'm hoping the Flathead Basin Commission and others host public facilitation meetings, come out, bring these ideas, invite us to your groups, come speak at our meetings. We need to harness these funding streams. 
we are hoping, uh, one of the ideas we're floating this Thursday is hiring an AIS coordinator at the tribal level. That's as much as I can say. Whether or not that will happen, I don't know. If we are able to fund that position, you're going to have a point of contact to call right here who can initiate a plan of action, start making phone calls, start mobilizing resources or accessing resources. So again, these public meetings are critical and I'm going to toot our tribal horn again. We're moving on this because we need to and, and you are here because you know that that's necessary. So go team. <laughs> I think what Georgia said is really important and is gives us hope, but also Chris and Brian from the park said it. They got stuff done because they were all pulling in the same direction, and that's an issue that we've had in the state where we haven't had this unified effort in one direction. There's been competition between agencies, there's been poor communication, there's been lack of funding, but if we all get on the same page and model like like George and the Tribes mentioned, use the model of the park, we can get it done. The park closed the water bodies the same day the announcement came out. The park closed all the water bodies in the basin that day. As did Blackfeet Nation, immediately. It took the state three weeks to decide to, declo to close the two water bodies that they had positive detections on. Who are they talking about for weeks when they have detections? They actually had the detections for months before they told anyone. So it's been really frustrating because there are these examples of people moving in the same direction, getting stuff done, and then there's what we have. Yeah. Paul, do you have something to say? Yeah, I'm gonna throw a bowl out in the China cabinet. <laughs> All right. Um, just because we're here as people because we care, I applaud Georgia's um, uh, speak to you all and encouraging you to be here and make your voice heard. My concern is that was brought to my t attention today. We are all for science. We want the best on the ground, the most uh, productive, positive, and, and way that we can identify and then begin to move on this. The bull in the closet, I guess, so what I was trying to say is I'm having concerns what I'm hearing today as well to share with you as a group, which gets down to what you were saying. Why are we having these differences and opinions? It's going on. My concern is methodology. I want to use the best science. So far, I'm leaning towards the EDNA. And what I'm hearing today from my, my co-workers is that there may be a difference of opinion on the types of methodology used. That's the bull in the China closet. Let's not be afraid to meet that head on and so we can move together <coughs> forward as a unified group to protect the resources. So Tom asked me if I want to comment on that. Um, so the field of environmental DNA has matured recently, and there's multiple labs doing eDNA testing reliably. And I think some higher ups and some agencies don't understand or want to believe that. And our tests and our samples we will also send to a lab in Minnesota, for example, who've been doing eDNA successfully and helped us out um, for years. So I would say that there's different tools one of them is sampling for the larvae in the water and looking under a microscope, and you can do that during spawning season. And some would say that's not early detection, because if they're spawning, they've been there for a while. Um, eDNA detection is another tool in the toolbox, and right now is a short window of time before spawning, which might start in June or, or May, to test for the water for presence of mussels, and also to swab and take water from boats, which Minnesota and and Manitoba and other uh, states and provinces are doing. Um, so there's multiple tools, dogs. You know, I think our state last year had three dogs. It would be sweet if we had six or nine or 12 dogs, but they're, they're hard to train up and to pass 
you know, it takes hundreds of dogs to get the three that we had last year, I think. So we need multiple approaches and multiple tools, and they are complementary. And we need a multiple-pronged approach in addition to, of course, education and sharing with your neighbors that you shouldn't launch if you're not clean, drained, and dry. But it's, I just said that's been really frustrating, disappointing, demoralizing, knowing that when they show up, and they will, it's not if, it's when, it's going to cost millions and millions, if not tens of millions, in the Flathead Basin alone, and the state legislature won't provide some millions annually for a better prevention and early detection program. And to Governor Bullock's um, support or complimentation, he had for the first time a state summit last year where different agencies, including Department of Transportation, which does checks on vehicles coming in, uh, agriculture, um, multiple agencies met in Helena and discuss what could be done. And I asked the question, if we know, we know, this has already happened in 30 some states where after the muscle showed up, it cost tens and tens of millions a year. Why aren't we investing more? And the few legislators, legislators I talked to said, political, it's difficult to pass law, I mean, you know, bills, um, and until they're in our face and it's really causing us problems, it's hard to get legislators to vote for funding for this issue. Maybe now since they're in our face, at least part of the state, they're here, something could be passed, but I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm not sure there'll be much money provided for prevention of spread, of especially zebra mussels, which are the nastiest of all. So I'll just add that there's multiple approaches. There's dogs and check stations and water sampling with DNA and subsequently divers and even digital photography where you can run a boat with a camera across the bottom and potentially visualize muscles if they're there. All right, I think we'll take one last question if there's one more. All right, oh, there it is. Sure. They, deeper than you want to hear, I think is the answer. Um, it's a, quagga mussels can go pretty deep. I think it's 100 feet, does that make right? About close to that? So they can go deep enough to um, be dark and still sampling, sam filtering enough water. Um, they tend to stick to the, to, the, to the illuminated regions of the lake, that's where the most phytoplankton is. Um, and really infested systems, it's, you know, they're competing for space. Um, it becomes not a competition of the rest of the lake, but a competition among among the mussels themselves. And they'll they'll go where they have to go to keep spreading until they find where they can. And unfortunately, that can be fairly deep. Um, I, I think that's a wrap, folks. I think what we'll say now is that I really appreciate everybody coming. I'd like to thank the panel. Let's give them a round of applause.